devoted. Yeah, welcome to Day Tutor Academy, where we are devoted to building academic excellence in students in the STEM subject. In this video, we are going to be doing an exam prep for the further mathematics exam. Now, this is going to be useful for you if you are preparing for your WIAC exam, you are preparing for your NECO, the GED exam, GCSE, IGCSE, your JAM, and even your post tme exam. Now, why did I say this? Even though it's going to be focusing on one of the past questions from WIAC for the mathematics paper, now the topics that are covered there are common to all the exams that are listed. So, if you are having difficulty in understanding them, just grinding look at the questions and you will see that actually you are going to be mastering your topics under the exams. Now, what I want to tell you before we go ahead is that you don't get excellence just by watching this video. Now, we are putting the video up because we are sure that it's going to help you, it's going to prepare you better, but just watching the video is not going to be enough. So, what will help you is for you to get your hands dirty Take your pen, take your biro, take your calculator, walk along with what we are going to be presenting here. And now, because we want you to actually prepare, not just to watch the video, we have actually included a PDF that you can download and also a link to our Tumblr page. There's also a link to the blogger page where all we want you to do is first take time to attempt the question yourself. The way the Tumblr page is arranged is that you are going to have to see the question first, okay? Now, for those of you that don't know the way to go about it, a small highlight of what you need to do will be presented, all right? Then, if you scroll down, you are going to see the solution that have been captured, just a picture. Then, if you think that looking at that is not yet good enough for you, then the link to the solution to that particular question is also included in the blog okay you can watch the video you can also see okay now that this is the step where i missed this is the step where i got right and with that definitely your preparation will be sound and wonderful there are three core things that you will discover by doing this and number one you are going to know your mistakes there are some things that you thought you got you thought oh yes i did it diligently i did it quite well but lo and behold you have made one mistake or the other so if you first attempt the question you are going to discover so this is the mistake i made so next time i'm not going to make that mistake and then number two you are going to know your weak areas now, you would have thought that maybe you are very good at, the, at this particular topic. You have covered a lot of ground on this particular topic. But by the time you are doing it, you just discover that, ah, no, that means that I still need to brush up on a topic. Maybe the equation of a circle is very weak for you. Maybe you don't understand the equation of motion, you know. By the time you actually lay your hands on this, this will be glaring for you to actually get. Then number three, you are going to also understand your core strength. The topics that you have mastered that no matter the type of question that is coming out from from it you can easily solve it now this will help you to focus on okay now i know this let me focus on what i don't know and those are the things that we actually want you to achieve we want you to actually prepare best so that this can be a means through which you gain academic excellence now before we go to our video we want to advocate that please subscribe to the channel we are putting in a lot of efforts to actually prepare students for academic excellence and your subscription is going to encourage us to help us to know that yes we are doing the right thing so go ahead and subscribe to the channel like the video share with your friends share with your loved ones and leave your comment below your feedback is very important to us we want to know okay what are the things we are getting right what are the things we can develop upon what are the things that we also need to also drop if they are not relevant so i wish you all the best and i'm sure you are going to attain that academic excellence in your exam so let's go ahead and solve our questions together in this question, we are to find the value of x minus 1 over x and leave the answer in the form m plus n root 5. So if we say we want to express x minus 1 over x, we can say we can find the LCM. Now this will be over 1. 1 in s is x. x times s will be s raised to the power 2 minus x is s is 1. 1 times 1 is 1. So we've been given x to be 2 plus root 5. So we can put in that value 2 plus root 5 raised to the power 2 minus 1 all divided by x which is 2 plus root 5. So 2 plus root 5 raised to the power 2 will be 2 plus root 5 multiplied by 2 plus root 5 minus 1 all divided by 2 plus root 5. So we have to multiply out these two sorts. First we do 2 multiplied by 2 then 2 multiplied by root 5 5 multiplied by 2 
and root 5 multiplied by root 5. So if you want to carry that operation out, you can say 2 multiplied by 2 is 2 into root 2 plus 2 multiplied by root 5 is 2 root 5. Again, we're having another 2 multiplied by root 5. That is again 2 root 5. Then multiply by root 5 times root 5 minus 1 all divided by 2 plus root 5. Now if we are to solve this, 2 root 5 and 2 root 5, we can say it's just like 2x plus 2x, which will give 4x. So we can say this is now going to be 4 root 5. Then square root of 5 multiplied by square root of 5 is as if we are having 5 raised to the power 1 over 2 times 5 raised to the power 1 over 2. And by the law of indices, that would be a single 5. Then we add the power, which will be 5 raised to the power 1, and that is 5. So we can say it will give us 2 multiplied by 2 is 4 plus 4 root 5 now, then plus 5 minus 1 all divided by 2 plus root 5. So we have 4 plus 5 is 9, 9 minus 1 is 8. So that would be 8 plus 4 root 5 divided by 2 plus root 5. Now, when we have an expression like this, I want to solve it. What we do is we rationalize this surgical expression. And how do we rationalize? We take the denominator and find its conjugate, then multiply both the numerator and the denominator by the conjugate of the denominator. The conjugate means that for a surgical, for, for this type of sort expression, we have 2 plus root 5. The conjugate will be the change in sign so that we have 2 minus root 5. So we are multiplying both the numerator and the denominator with 2 minus root 5. And that will give, and now we have 8 multiplied by 2, that is 16. Then 8 multiplied by minus 5, that will be minus 8 root 5, okay? Then 4 root 5 multiplied by 2. The 2 will multiply the 4 to give us plus 8 root 5, then root 4 root 5 multiplied by minus root 5. That's if we have 1 in front. 4 and 1 is 4. But root 5 multiplied by root 5, we have got initially to be 5. So that would be like 4 multiplied by 5. That would be minus 4 multiplied by 5. All divided by 2 multiplied by 2 is 4. Let's just write this out. Okay, 2 multiplied by minus root 5 is minus 2 root 5, plus 2 multiplied by root 5 is 2 root 5, then minus root 5 multiplied by root 5 is 5. So we can now write this out. Minus 8 root 5 and 8 root 5 will cut out. Minus 2 root 5 and 2 root 5 will cut out, leaving us with 16 minus 20 divided by 4 minus 5. 16 minus 20 is minus 8, 4 minus 5 is minus 1, and our answer will now be the negative will cancel out and we have it. But we have to leave our answer in the expression in the form m plus n root 5. There is no root 5. That means 0 is a coefficient of root 5. And our answer is 8 plus 0 root 5. In our question from integration here, we are given that the integral of 2x plus 5 dx and um, when we are taking the integral from t to 1 is equal to 18. And we are asked to find the value of t. Right from the onset of this question, I want us to note something. We are asked to find the value, not the values of t. So yeah, normally, ideally, if you want to find the integral of um, a coefficient a multiplied by x raised to power n, that will give us a multiplied by that x now, increasing the power by 1 and dividing all through by the new power, which is n plus 1. So, for our equation here, we can say this equation will now give us 2 raised, multiplied by x raised to power 1 plus 1, because the power initially is 1, we had another 1, and also divide by the new power, 1 plus 1, then plus, you can say plus 5. 5 standing alone is as if you are saying 5 multiplied by x raised to power 0 because x raised to the power 0 is 1, and 5 times 1 is 5. So now we now add 1 to the power of x plus 1 over the new power 0 plus 1. 
and we are taking that integral from t to 1 and that will be equal to 18. If we open up this, this is going to give us 2 multiplied by x raised to the power 2 divided by 2 plus 5 multiplied by x over 1 and the 2 can cancel out. That integral will take from t to 1 and we say is equal to 18. So we'll cancel that our 2, this is equal to 18. Meaning that what we are going to have eventually is s squared plus 5x and we need to take the integral between 1 and t is equal to 18. So now we are asked to find this value of t and the lower value for the integration that we are taking is actually 1. The higher value is t. So we can now substitute first t into the equation. So where we see x, we are going to use t. So we have t squared plus 5t minus, instead of x, we are now using 1. 1 raised to the power 2 plus 5 multiplied by 1 is equal to 18. If we are to open that up, that will give us t raised to the power 2 plus 5t minus 1 raised to the power 2 is 1 plus 5, that will be 6. So we have minus 6. Is, and if we bring 18 to the left hand side, minus 18 is equal to 0, such that we have a quadratic equation t squared plus 5t minus 24 is equal to 0. Now, how can we solve for t here? We can easily use our factorization method. And what we are looking for is um, the factors that we give a product of 1 t squared and minus 24, giving minus 24 t squared. So, and then the sum is going to be 5t. So what are the what are the factors of minus 24 t squared? Let's leave the negative sign for now. To get 24 t squared, you can say 12 t and 2 t. You can say 8 t and 3 t. You can say 6 t and 4 t and co. Now, 12 and 2 and 6 and 4 is not going to add up to get um, 5 t. But if you have 8 t minus 3 t, that will give us 5 t. So instead of writing 5 t, you can say t raised to the power 2 minus 8t plus 8t minus 3t minus 24 is equal to 0, such that if we take out the common term, in the first two terms, t is common, then we'll have t plus 8 remaining. In the last two terms, minus 3 is common, then we'll have t plus 8. Note, it's plus now, because minus 3, 3 by plus 8 will give minus 24. So, this means that we have t minus 3 and t plus 8 multiplying each other to give us 0 as the same as our quadratic equation. In such a case, t will now be 3 or t is minus 8. But now, remember in the, in the initial question, I said we should note that we were asked to find the value of t, not the values of t. And here, 1 is the lower value. 18 is a positive number and t is the higher value, meaning that we are starting our integration from 1 as a lower value, then the higher value has to be positive. So t, the value for t will have to be positive and we'll conclude that our t is 3 and not minus 8. And minus 8 is quite far. It's also on the negative value of the x coordinate. So our correct answer is 3. Yeah, in this question on matrix X, we are given that the matrix B is 2, 3, 1, 4, and then B squared plus 3B plus 2I is 3N, and I is a unit 2 by 2 matrix. So we have to find the value of the matrix N. Now we have B squared, 3B, and 2I, and these are all we need to add together to get 3N. So let's go ahead and take them piecewise. Now, B raised to the power 2 will be the multiplication of this singular, this matrix in two places. So we have 2314 multiplied by 2314. So how do we multiply? We multiply row by column. So the 2 and 3 is going to be multiplying the 2 and 1. 2 and 3 in the first row, 2 and 1 in the second row. And what we do is first we are going to multiply 2 multiplied by 2, then plus the second entity in the row and the second entity in the column multiply by 3 multiply by 1 then we take the same first row multiply by the second column of the second matrix so we have 2 multiply by 3 okay 
So we have two multiplied by three plus three multiplied by four. We are multiplying the row by the column. Then the second row of the first matrix and the first column of the second matrix, then the second column of the second matrix, we have one multiplied by two plus four multiplied by one. Then the last entry, one multiplied by three plus four multiplied by four. There is a symmetry we need to note so that we don't make mistakes. We can see that two, one, three, and four, they maintain their position. Then two and two, three and three, one and one and four and four like this. We just need to watch out for this symmetry to know that we are actually on track. So we are to do this will be 2 times 2 is 4 plus 3 times 1 is 3. Then 2 times 1 is 2 plus 4 times 1 is 4. 2 times 3 is 6 plus 3 times 4 12. 1 times 3 is 3 plus 4 times 4 16. Such that B raised to power 2 will be 7, 18, 8, and 19. That's B raised to power 2. Then what is the value of 3B? We just introduce 3 to the matrix B. So we have 3 multiplied by each of the entity of the matrix. 3 times 2 will be 6. 3 times 3, 9. 3 times 1, 4. 3 times 4, 12. Then we want to get um, 2i, where i is the 2 by 2 matrix, 2 by 2 unit matrix. The 2 by 2 unit matrix will be 1 is the only entity in the leading diagonal of the matrix as shown. So if you multiply out, we have 2, 0, 0, 2, and that is too high. So all of this, if we add them together, we are going to get 3n. So we can now say 3n is equal to b raised to power 2, and that is 7, 18, 6, 19, 7, 18, 6, 19, okay, plus 3b, we got 3b as 6, 9, 3, 12, to say plus 6, 9, 3, 12, okay, plus 2i, and 2i is just 2, 0, 0, 2, so we have 2, 0, 0, 2, and if we are to add that, the, four, the entries in the first column and first row, we add them together, in the second column and the first row, we add them together, just 7, 6, and 2 here. Yeah. Then we add 18, 9, and 0 because they are in the first row, the second column. So we have 18 plus 9 plus 0. Then in the same manner, we also do 6 plus 3 plus 0 and 19 plus 12 plus 2. And if we add all this, 7 plus 6 plus 2 will be 13 plus 2. That will be 15. 18 plus 9 is 27. 6 plus 3 is 9. 19 plus 14, that will be 33. So, this is the value of 3n. This is the value of 3n. And to get n, all we just need to do, just as if we are working with our normal mathematical operations, we divide both sides by 3, such that now we can have, um, say, we can have 3n over 3, and the 3 will cut out, will be 1 over 3 multiplied by 15, 27, 9, and 33. Each of those entities will be divided by 3. The 3 on the left hand side will cut themselves out such that um, we can now say this is 15 over 3, then 27 over 3, 9 over 3, and lastly 33 over 3. Meaning that the value of n that we are asked to find out, n will be 15 over 3 is 5, 27 over 3 is 9, 9 over 3 is 3. Uh, 3 over 3 is 11, and that is the value of n. Here in this question, we are given that the radius of a circle whose equation is given is 3 root 2, and we are to find the value of c and the equation of the diameter through the point 9, 2. Now, the equation that we are given in this particular question, if we notice, it is the general form of a circle equation. And for us to get the value of c, how best can we go about this? We can easily get the value of c if we are to employ the standard form of a circle equation that is giving us x minus a all raised to power 2 plus y minus b all raised to power 2 is equal to r raised to power 2. This 
is the standard form of a circuit equation. And um, the definition of the parameters is that A comma B is the center of the circle, and then the radius is given as R. So A comma B is the center of the circle, and R is the radius of the circle. So now, how do we translate from this equation of the circle that we are given with an unknown C and go to the standard form of the equation of a circle. If we are able to actually get that, then our question will be easily solved. The first thing we need to do is to first rearrange. So we have x squared minus 4x plus y squared minus 2y is equal to minus c. And if you want to get the standard form, what we do is we complete the square. So the question before us now is how do we complete the square of a given equation? We complete the square by following what I broke down into three steps. First, here yeah, we are having x squared minus 4x. We get half of the coefficient of the variable, not the square, half of the coefficient of the variable. Now, the variable is x. We are going to get half of its coefficient. The coefficient is minus 4. So we get half of minus 4. Then we square it and add it to the equation. But since here we are talking about x raised to pi, so we do that for x and we do that for y. Now, the coefficient of the variable x is minus 4, and the coefficient of the variable y is minus 2. So half of this coefficient is going to be minus 2 and minus 1. And by the time we square them, we get minus 2 raised to the power 2 and minus 1 raised to the power 2. These are the values that we had to both sides of the equation. So if you are to carry that out, we have x squared minus 4x plus minus 2 raised to the power 2. But we know minus 2 raised to the power 2 is 4. So we say plus 4. Then plus y squared minus 2y plus minus 1 raised to the power 2. And minus 1 raised to the power 2, we know is 1, is equal to minus c. But what we are adding to the left-hand side, we also add to the right-hand side. So we add 4 and 1 to the right-hand side. So we have minus c plus 4 plus 1. We are doing it to both sides. So now... If you look at this equation, let's take the x and group them together and y group them together. Now, this expression x squared minus 4x plus 4, how do we express it to translate into the standard form we are looking for? We need to recall that if we have, let's say, now x plus minus 2, since that is half of the coefficient we were talking about, x plus minus 2 raised to power 2 will be the same for us as x minus 2 or raised to power 2. That will be x minus 2 multiplied by x minus 2. So if we are to multiply this out, x and x will give us x square. So we have x square. Now x and minus 2, x and minus 2 will give us minus 2x if you multiply them out. Minus 2 and x will give us, again, minus 2x, then minus 2 and minus 2. The negative signs will multiply each other to give us plus, then 2 times 2 is 4, so we have plus 4. This is nothing but x squared minus 4x plus 4. So instead of writing the whole of our equation in x, instead of writing x squared minus 4x plus 4, we can substitute x minus 2 all raised to power 2 into our equation. So we have x minus 2 all raised to power 2. And the same thing applies for y. So we have plus y minus. Now, what we are going to use is 1. y minus 1 raised to power 2. And that is equal to minus c. Plus 4 and plus 1 is plus 5. So now we have this format of our equation. And we can now compare with the that we are giving, we can know that um, now we have x minus 2 raised to the power 2 plus y minus 1 raised to the power 2 is equal to minus c plus 5. If you compare with the standard form of the circuit equation, which is given as x minus a all raised to the power 2 plus y minus b all raised to the power 2 is equal to r raised to the power 2, we can see that the center of the circle, um, a comma b, which is the center of the circle, is now equal to 2 comma 1 and then the radius of the circle now we are having the radius raised to power 2 that will give us minus c plus 5 so in the equation we are given that 
the radius is nothing but 3 root 2. So if you are to use that value, that r is equal to 3 root 2 into the equation for the radius, we can say 3 root 2 raised to power 2 is equal to minus c plus 5. Saying now, 3 root 2 raised to power 2 is like saying 3 root 2 multiplied by 3 root 2. And we can carry this as by saying that now the 3 will multiply each other. 3 times 3 is 9. Then we have root 2 times root 2 is 2. And that will be equal to minus c plus 5. And if you just rearrange the expression that we are getting now, we can have it that when c moves to the left hand side, that becomes c instead of minus c, we have c, will be 5 minus 18, and that is minus 13. So, the value of our c is nothing but minus 13. And expressing our equation in the standard form of the circle equation had helped us to solve this question. So, we can now move on to the equation of the diameter through 9, 2. Equation of the diameter through 9, 2. Now, a diameter is normally a straight line. And if you want to depict that, remember that we have gotten the center of our circle we have gotten the center circle from the standard form of the equation as AB and our AB is 2,1. So that means that we have a point. Normally, the diameter will pass through the center of the circle, starting from the circumference of the circle, go through the center of the circle to the other point on the circumference of the circle. So we have the center AB as 2,1 and we are told that the diameter passes through the point 9,2. If you are to draw our Cartesian coordinate and try to locate this point, let's say we have a gradation of our Cartesian coordinate like this, and on the y axis we can say we just have um, 1, 2. Then on the x axis we can say 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. Let's try and locate this point, point 2, 1, point 2, 1. It will be where 2 on the x axis and 1 on the y axis are intersecting just as shown then point 9 comma 2 now will be between 8 and 10 then 2 is there so where they intersect is just as shown also now this is a comma b which is 2 comma 1 and then 9 comma 2 the equation of the diameter will be the equation of the straight line that is passing through these two points so what we are now left with is how do we get the equation of this straight line passing through the point 9,2 and the point 2,1? There is a standard form of, there is a general way that we can get the equation of a straight line because this is a straight line. And if we are to employ that, we can easily solve this question by saying y minus y1 over x minus x1 is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. That means these two points, we take one of the points as point 1, take the second as point 2. We can take any one, it's going to give us the same answer. So, taking the center of the circle as point 1 and the point 9,2 as point 2, we are going to have y minus y1, y1 will now be 1, x minus x1, x1 will now be 2, over y2 minus y1, that will be 2 minus 1 over x2 minus x1 will be 9 minus 2 and that will give us um, 1 over 7 such that if we cross multiply by the time we cross multiply we can say that 7 multiplied by y minus 1 is equal to 1 multiplied by x minus 2 so opening our bracket that will give us 7 y minus 7 is x minus 2 and we take 7 to the other side we can have 7 y is x minus 2 plus 7 such that we will have 7y is equal to x plus and horse 5 and that is the equation of the diameter through point 9 comma 2. What we need to note is that the diameter will run through that point and also through the radius of the circle and with that our question is solved for us. We are told that the basket contains 4 ripe oranges, 3 unripe oranges and 5 bananas and we are to Find the number of ways in which first one orange and one banana can be selected from the basket. Now, um, this is a good question on combinations. And in the first case, in which we want to select one orange and one banana from the basket, 
There are a total of seven oranges, including the ripe and the unripe ones, and a total of five bananas. So our task is now to get the number of ways in which we can select one orange out of seven oranges and understand that whether it is ripe or unripe, that is not a factor. We are only considering that one out of seven oranges and one out of five bananas. Now, this is given by the formula seven combination one, that is one out of seven, and for the banana, yeah, it's five combination one. So we just need to put in our combination formula, which seven combination one is seven factorial over seven minus one, one factorial, and five combination one is five factorial over five minus one factorial, one factorial. So seven factorial is seven times six factorial because I know that seven minus one will be six factorial at the numerator so that the six factorials will cancel out. Multiply by five factorial, which is five times four factorial over five minus one factorial is four factorial. So the four factorial will also cancel out. We are left with seven multiplied by five and that is 35 ways to get one orange and one banana out of a basket full of seven oranges and five bananas. Now, in question number B, you want to select three oranges and four bananas. Just like in the first case, what we are going to have is we want to select three out of seven oranges and four out of five bananas. So that is going to give us seven combination three multiplied by five combination four. So that will be seven combination three multiplied by five combination four because it's three out of seven and four out of five. That will be 7 factorial over 7 minus 3 factorial multiplied by 3 factorial times 5 factorial divided by 5 minus 4 factorial, 4 factorial. So since we will be dividing, we can stop at the factorial that we can cut out the numerator factorial. So we can have 7 times 6, 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 factorial divided by 7 minus 3 factorial is 4 factorial. Then 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1. So 4 factorial will cancel out. 3 times 2 is 6. And that will cancel out 6. And on the other case, we have 5 factorial is 5 times 4 is 1. Factorial, so that 4 factorial can cancel out. Then 5 minus 4 is 1 factorial. And that is 1. Then minus 4 factorial. The 4 factorial cancels out. So yeah, we're also going to have this we give 7 times 5 times 5. And that will be 7 times 5 is 35. 35 times 5, that will be 175 ways. Good. So now we can move on to this third case in which we need to note what we are being told. These first two cases are quite easy to get. But now in question number C, we are being told that we are to select two unripe oranges out of three unripe oranges. So that will be two out of three unripe oranges. Now we are separating the oranges. That okay, these oranges are ripe, these oranges are unripe. So two out of three unripe oranges, three combination two. One ripe orange out of four ripe oranges will be one out of four ripe oranges. And that will be four combination one four combination one okay and then three bananas out of five bananas that'll be three out of five bananas that will also give us five combination three so because we are separating ripe oranges from unripe oranges this is the way that we we'll go about it and the number of ways to select everything will be the multiplication of these combinations so we have 3 combination 2 times 4 combination 1 times 5 combination 3. So to solve that, that will give us 3 times 2 factorial divided by 3 minus 2 factorial 2 factorial. So, and the next one will be 4 times 3 factorial divided by 4 minus 1 factorial 1 factorial. Now I'm stopping at 3 and 2 at the numerator because I know that that will eventually cut the factorials are the denominator. So the third case, we have 5 times 4 times 3 factorial divided by 5 minus 3 factorial, 3 factorial. So I can cut out the factorials that are similar. 2 is cutting here. 4 minus 1 is 3, so that will cut 3 factorial. 
then three factorial will also cut there so that what we are left with is three divided by three minus three is one one factorial is one times four over one okay multiply by um, five times four divided by five minus three is two factorial which is two times one so two can go here one two in four two and the multiplication of the remaining numbers three times four is twelve times five is sixty times two is one twenty so we have one twenty ways of picking two unripe oranges one ripe orange and three bananas from the basket in this question we are asked to use the graph method to estimate the modal age of the workers whose um, statistics of age and the number of workers were given in the table as shown so what well, this is telling us that we should actually get to draw our histogram and from the histogram estimate the mode because the histogram is what we normally use to get the mode and in this case we are getting the modal age of the workers so if we tabulate the information that we are giving we need to get the lower class boundary and the upper class boundary we subtract 0 0.5 from the lower class boundary and add 0 0.5 to the upper class boundary so that in this case we have 19.5 to 24.5 as our class boundary okay the first entry is the lower class boundary the second entry is the upper class boundary so we do that for each um for each data that is indicating the age of the worker so here we have 39.5 to 44.5 okay then 44.5 to 49.5 then 49.5 to 54.5 and finally 54.5 to 59.5 so we are going to plot um, the histogram by making use of the class boundary against the number of workers that were given so here we are bringing in our graph and we are noting that on the class boundary we are having 19.5 to 59.5 as the data that we need to put on the class boundary as this and then for the workers we are noticing that 12 is the least 38 is the highest number of workers when we group them by each so we have 12 to 38 on the number of workers as is which we also correspond to something like say our frequency now i'm noting this because i want to scale appropriately when we are working with questions like this it's not necessarily it's not a compulsory it's not by compulsion that we should actually start from zero we can actually for the best fit of our graph is best that we look at a point the way we can start not necessarily with zero so if i draw my horizontal and my vertical axis and for the histogram normally on the vertical axis we have the frequency but in this case is the number of workers okay and then on the horizontal axis we have the class boundary and our class boundary we have defined already from our table and the class boundary is in years okay so now how best can we actually put in this data starting from 20.5 to 59.5 on the class boundary as is and then we notice that if we say we are not starting from zero we notch our graph as shown then we put in the first entry that is 19.5 then if you just increase each of the step of the graph the thicker lines if you just take it as the entries that we are going to be using 20, um, 19.5, 24.5, 29.5, 34.5, 44.5, 49.5, 54.5, 59.5. We notice that in this we are having um, a, a spacing of 5, 5 units was from 19.5 to 24.5 is 5 units okay now our unit here is here so we can put our scale that centimeter which is the space between the thicker lines of the graph represents um, 5 years on the class boundary as is okay so if you are, if you are using that and then we can go to our vertical axis now we are through with the horizontal axis we see that our least value is also 12 and the highest value is 38 we don't also need to start from zero so i'm going to also notch that so i'm putting 
let's say an increment of um, four four units. So twelve plus four sixteen, sixteen plus four twenty, twenty plus four twenty four, and we will end at forty. So between twelve and forty, we have all the inputs that we need because we are stopping at thirty eight. So on the vertical axis, we are seeing that two centimeter is representing four workers. Okay. Two centimeters is representing four workers on the number of workers as is, which is the vertical axis. So with this, we cannot go ahead to say we want to plot our graph. We want to plot our histogram so that we can estimate the mode from the histogram. Now, for the number of workers, we have 22. Then the class boundary, we have 19.5 to 24.5. So 22 is in between 20 and 24. Then 20.5 to 24.5 is as shown. And we can just draw our bar, okay? So in the next case, we are having 24 as the number of workers, then taking the value from 24.5 to 29.5, just as shown. Then the next one, we are having 30, okay? 30 is here. And on like that, we can just plot the next, the, the, the class boundary for the 30 is, 29.5 to 34.5 and then the next entry is for the 38 number of workers and their class boundary is 34.5 to 39.5 the next we have 36 and 39.5 to 44.5 which is as shown then we have 30 and 44.5 to 49.5 we've gotten 30 before so we just also go there 30 then between 44.5 to 49.5 then we are coming down to 18, okay, 49.5 to 54.5, and then finally to 12, 54.5 to 59.5. So we just need to complete our graph by just joining all the bars. And then this, when we are true, will give us the histogram of the data that we are giving. And how do we get the mode from that histogram? We look at the highest bar, okay? Then we draw from the two adjoining bars to meet the opposite side of the bar. And the point of intersection of um, that joining, it will look like X. That will be our modal H, all right? So now we have our histogram already. So let's go ahead to see how we can just... Okay, let's label this. This is the histogram. This is the histogram of the given data. Okay, it's always appropriate to label your graph. So now, we can look at how to get our model. Just like I said before, we take the um, IS bar, that's the one here. So we join, we draw a line from the adjoining bars to the opposite side. Then we do the same thing here. And the point of intersection here, we are going to trace with the class boundary in axis. That's the horizontal axis. And whatever value we have there is going to be our modal H. Now we have we have 34.5 to 39.5. And we already know that that's 5, 5 units. So each is just one unit because we have five division on my graph here. So we have that 4.5, that 5.5, that 6.5, that 7.5. So this is 38.5. So from the graph, as we are requested from the question, the modal H, okay, the modal H is 38.5. The modal H is equal to 38.5 years. And that is the solution to our question. All right. And in this question, we are given that a triangle PQR have vertices 2, 2, 3, minus 1, and 4, 0, respectively. Now we are to use vector method. Notice that we have been told what method to use. We are to use vector method to calculate angle PQR. Now, all these points that we have been noting, 2, 2, 3, 1, minus 1, and 4, 0, if you are to write them out, that means P is 2, 2, Q is 3, minus 1, 
and r is 4 comma 0. Let's see how we can locate this on the Cartesian coordinate so that we can get our vector out and use the vector method to calculate the angle PQR. So if we are to draw a Cartesian coordinate and scale it on a gradation of 1 in 1 unit. So we have minus 1, minus 2, then 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4. If we are to locate all these points, Point P is 2, comma 2. So 2 and 2. This is point P. Okay. Point Q is 3, comma minus 1. 3 on the X axis, minus 1 on the Y axis. So this is point Q. And the R is 4, comma 0. That will be 4. And so these are the vertices that were given. And if we are to join the three points together, Q to P and Q to R, yeah, since we are told that we are to use the vector method, what we can say is we can take Q as our origin, then vectors emanating from it will be vector QP and vector QR. And then we are to find angle PQR, Q being the center. So the angle we are asked to find is being shaded in red. So this, let's call it angle theta. So now, with respect to vector, how do we go about solving this type of questions? If you are to find angle PQR, now, what would be ideal for us to use is just to know that the angle theta, the angle PQR, is actually the angle between the vectors QP and QR. And now the order is of utmost importance to us. We don't want to mix that um, order of angle it is angle between the vector qr and vector qp q being the emanating point since that's where we are taking our angle from so now we are being saddled with some responsibilities um, we know that using the dot for dot we can say that the vector qp dot the vector qr is going to give us the magnitude of the vector qp multiplied by the magnitude of the vector QR, multiplied by the cosine of the angle between the two vectors, in this case, cosine theta. So now, um, vector QP and QR, we're going to evaluate, um, the magnitude of QP and the magnitude of QR, we are going to evaluate, and cos theta is going to give us QP dot QR, divided by the magnitude of QP, multiply by the magnitude of QR. So, evaluating the vectors QP, QR, and their magnitude is going to help us to solve this question. So now, how do we get the vector QP? QP will be the difference in the position vectors P and Q. Since Q is the source, we are going to say P minus Q. And since we know our P to be 2 comma 2, that will be 2i plus 2j minus Q. Q will now be 3 comma minus 1, which is 3i minus j. You know, we have 3 comma minus 1, so we say 3i minus j. And if you are to open that bracket, that will be 2i plus 2j minus 3i. Now, minus, minus j will give us plus j because negative, we multiply each other to give a positive number. So if you are to resolve that, that will be... 2i minus 3i is minus i, 2j plus j is 3j, and that is vector qp. And the magnitude will be the square root of the sum of the square of its components. So we have square root of minus 1 raised to power 2 plus 3 raised to power 2. That will be square root of 1 plus 9, which is root 10. That is the magnitude of vector qp. Now, moving on and solving for qr in the same manner, QR is going to be R minus Q. Again, because Q is our common point where we are originating from. And the position vector of R is 4 comma 0. So R will correspond to 4i plus 0j. 0j because 0 is the component for y. Then minus Q, which is 3i minus j. If you are to open this bracket also, we have 4i plus 0j minus 3i the negative sign again will multiply each other to be positive so we have plus j so this will give us 4i minus 3i is i 
zero j plus j is j and then we can also find the magnitude of the vector qr to be the square root of now it's just one one raised to the power two plus one raised to the power two and that will be the square root of two so root two is the magnitude of vector qr after clearing our board we can now see our cos theta is equal to the dot product of our two vectors vector qp dot vector qr divided by the magnitude of the two vectors magnitude of qp multiplied by the magnitude of qr all we just need to do is to slot in all these that we have gotten initially such that cos theta is going to be equal to our vector qp which is minus i plus 3j dot our vector qr which is i plus j divided by the magnitude of qp which we got to be um square root of square root of 10 multiplied by the square root of 2 which is the magnitude of vector q to find the dot product of the vectors we multiply the i component and add it to the product of the j component so here we have minus 1 multiplied by 1 plus now the j component we have 3 and 1 plus 3 multiplied by plus 3 multiplied by 1 divided by we have root 10 multiplied by root 2 that will be root 20 so minus 1 times 1 is minus 1 plus 3 times 1 is 3 divided by root 20 so if you are to evaluate that if you are to evaluate that that means cos theta is uh, minus 3 minus 1 plus 3 is 2 divided by root 20 um, well root 20 is the same thing as um, square root of 4 multiplied by 5 and then that will be 2 over square root of 4 multiplied by square root of 5 now square root of 4 is 2 so we can say that as 2 over 2 root 5 the 2 we cancel out so cos theta is 1 divided by root 5 and we can say in that case theta will be arc cos 1 over root 5 so we can bring in our calculator now to evaluate the value of theta to say that um arc arc cos 1 divided by root 5 okay that will be 63.43494882 we can round that up as appropriate as we like and i can say that is 63.43 degrees that is the angle pqr that we got using the vector method in this question we are told that a motorist is moving along a straight road with a uniform acceleration the motorist passes a village x with velocity 8 meter per seconds and another village z with a velocity 30 meter per seconds the distance between x and z is 2700 meters if village y is the midpoint of the distance between x and z we are to find um, the time taken by the motorist to move from village x to village z so if we are to look at our information and interpret them we have village x we have village z and then the velocity when it's passing through village x is 8 meter per seconds so as x we have u is 8 meter per seconds and the velocity when passing through village z is 30 meter per second so we have v and at z is 30 meter per seconds so okay we are given the distance between the two villages x and z as 2700 meters so we can denote that this is 2700 meters right then we are told that um, village y is the midpoint of the distance between x and z okay so we are now given all this information we are now being asked to 
Okay, we are told also that the acceleration is uniform. Uniform acceleration means that the rate of change of the velocity is constant. Okay, so we are now being asked to find the time taken to cover the distance between village X and village Z. Okay, now having a good understanding of our question is the first step that we need to take, and we have taken that. Now, the next step we need to take, what we need to ask ourselves is that how do we go about solving these questions? And um, this is actually a question of equation of motion, and there are three equations that we can use. You can say v square is u square plus 2as. We can use s is ut plus half a t square, and then acceleration a is v minus u over t, where v is the final velocity, u initial velocity, t is the time taken, a is the acceleration, and s is the distance taken. Now, for this particular question, we are looking for t. So, the last two equations, if we take the value of the acceleration, v minus u over t, and use in the equation for the distance, we can get our time. So, getting the acceleration, we can say is the final velocity minus initial velocity, which is 13 minus 8 over t. That will give us 5 over t. So if we are to use this in the equation s is equal to ut plus half a t square, we are going to have s is equal to u, which is 8, multiplied by t plus half. Our acceleration is now 5 over t multiplied by t squared. The t's we cancel out so that s will be 8 t plus 5 over 2 t. And if we are to find the LCM, we have to, this will be 16t plus 5t. Cross multiplying is going to give us 2s is equal to 16 plus 5 is 21t. Such that our t will now be 2s divided by 21. Now, what's the value of s? We're giving us 2700. So, t is 2 times 2700 over 21. 2 times 2,700 is 5,400. And if you bring in our calculator and we have to express it to the nearest old number, you can find the value of the time t. That will be 5,400 divided by 21. Okay, just the question is to the nearest old number. So our answer is going to be 257 seconds. That is the time taken between village x and Z. In this question, we are told that point L, which has its coordinate as minus 1, comma 0, and then point M, 3, 7, and N, 5, comma, minus 2, at the midpoint of um, the sides B, C, C, and A, B of triangle A, B, C. And we are to find the equation of line A, B. Now, for how to go about this, it will be best for us to see the position of all these locations with respect to one another. And so, if we draw our um, Cartesian coordinates and we try to locate all these points, we will say that gradating with respect to one one units, we are going to be able to locate point L, which is minus one on the x axis and zero on the y, that is point L, and then point M, which is three and seven. This is just a rough sketch, this is point M, and then point N is five comma minus two, that will be located here. So this is N. So now these are the spatial arrangements of the three points, and we are told that they are the midpoints of the sides B, C, C, A, and A, B, respectively. So, the midpoint of BC is L, the midpoint of CA is M, and the midpoint of AB is N. So, if you are to try and draw out our triangle, just to have a feel of how these are distributed on the triangle, let's say we have first AB, M, and the midpoint is N. So, we are going to have um, point A and point B. Then BC and AC. Okay. So the midpoint of CA is M, and the midpoint of 
BC is L. So now, since M and L are the midpoint of the side AC and BC, that means they are going to be parallel to the point AB. So if you draw a straight line from M to L, that line will be parallel to the line AB. And now, if two lines are parallel, there are some characteristics that they share. In this case, we are going to say that first, what we are noticing is that N, point N, is located on the line AB. So the coordinate of point N is going to bear relevance to the line AB, which we are asked to find. And then the line LM and the line AB, since they are parallel to each other, they are also going to share the same slope. Now, lines that are parallel to each other are always having the same slope. So, LM and AB, they have the same slope. And we also notice that N is a point on the line AB. Now, for us to get the slope of either LM or AB, we know that slope is changing Y over changing X. Now, to get a change in Y, we have point M and point L. What is the difference between the coordinates in, with respect to Y and with respect to X? So we can say for ML, M is 3, 7, L is minus 1, 0. So the change in Y will be 7, 7 minus 0 for the Y. And then the change in X will be first for M, 3 minus minus 1. We don't want to leave out that negative 1. And this, if we solve, is going to be the spot line LM, which is 7 over 3 minus minus 1 is 3 plus 1, and that is 4. So now that means that for the equation of line AB, we have gotten the slope to be 7 over 4, and then we also know that one of the points is point N. So we can use this to say the line AB and the line LM, they also have the same slope, which is given as um, 7 over 4. And if we want to use this to actually get the equation of the line, all we need to do is to go ahead and say that point N, which has coordinate 5 comma minus 2, we can actually use this slope and this point to get the equation of the line AB. And how do we go about that? There is a general form of equation of a line. So if we are to use the general form of the equation of a line, that saying y minus y1 over x minus x1, ideally we say is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, which is the same as change in y over change in x. Then y1 and x1 we have gotten as 5 comma minus 2. So if we have to use this value, we are going to have y minus, the value of y at point n is minus 2, then x minus the value of x at point n, which is 5, is equal to our slope 7 over 4. So if you are to cross multiply and say y minus minus 2, the negative sign will multiply to give y plus 2 is equal to 7 into x minus 5. And opening the bracket, we have 4y plus 4 times 2 is 8 is equal to 7x minus 7 times 5 is 35. So if you rearrange, you can have 4y is 7x minus 35. Now, Plus it crossing to the other side will be minus a such that our equation is 4y is 7x minus 43. And with that, our question is solved. In this question, we are given that the function f of x is equal to ps squared plus qs plus r and pq and r are constants. Then if function of 1 is 0, function of minus 1 is 4, and function of 2 is 7, we are to find first and foremost the values of pq and r. Now what we are going to do is we are going to be substituting for the function of 1, minus 1, and 2 into the equation. So in the first case, when they are saying function of 1 is 0, that means in the equation, everywhere we see x, we are now going to use 1, just as being shown, and we equate everything to 0. So for the first case, we have p plus q plus r is equal to 0. This we can call equation 1, okay? Then we can go to the second case, function of minus 1 is equal to 4. So function of minus 1 is equal to 4, meaning that everywhere we see x, we are going to put minus 1. So we are p into minus 1 raised to the power 2 plus q multiplied by minus 1 plus r is equal to 4. And 
minus 1 raised to the power 2 is 1, so we have P minus 1 times Q is minus Q plus R is equal to 4. I can call this equation 2. Then for the third case, function of 2 is equal to 7. So function of 2 is equal to 7. Then substituting 2 for X, we're having P multiplied by 2 raised to the power 2 plus Q multiplied by 2 plus R is equal to 7. So 2 raised to the power 2 is 4. We have 4P and 2 times Q is 2Q plus R is equal to 7. This is equation 3. So we have a simultaneous equation in three variables here. Three, first check with your calculator. So if I'm to bring in my calculator now, and I'm going to the mode, then 5 corresponds to equation 5. Then M2 is the one that is looking similar to what I'm trying to solve. So I'm pressing 2. Two. So now I will input the coefficient of my unknowns. For P, Q, and R in the first equation, it is just 1, 1, and 1, and it is equal to 0. So for the second equation, I'm having P, that's 1, then minus Q, that's minus 1, R, that's 1, then 4 as D. And in the third equation, I have 4P, so 4, then 2Q, 2, R is just 1, then everything is equal to 7. So if I just press my equal to, it's telling me that the calculator is using x, y, and z. I know I'm using p, q, and r. So I'm having 3 minus 2 and minus 1 as my solution. I will just keep this. And while I'm working, just to check that I'm on track, I know that that should be my final answer. So let's go ahead to try and solve this. I uh, said so we have equations 1, 2, 3. And we are going to be eliminating um, some variables. So if you add equation 1 and 2, we can see that we have plus Q in 1, we have minus Q in 1. So P in the two instances is going to give us 2P. Q plus minus Q will knock themselves out. So that will be 0. Then R plus R is 2R. 0 plus 4 is 4. Now I can divide this equation all 2 by 2 because I can see that 2 can go in all of the entities so that I can have P plus R equals, is equal to 2. I can call this equation 4. Then, okay. Now, looking at equations 2 and 3. Now, I, I, if I multiply equation 2 by 2, I can eliminate Q also because I have minus Q and 2Q. So, if I make that minus 2Q and add the 2, it's going to eliminate Q also. So, I will say equation 2, equation 3, I will add to 2 multiplied by equation 2. Okay, because my target is just like I eliminated Q in equation 4, I also want to eliminate Q again. So, equation 3 will be 4P plus 2Q plus R is equal to 7. Then, 2 multiplied by equation 2 will be 2P minus 2Q plus 2R is equal to 8. Each of the entities are multiplying by 2. So, if I'm to add the 2, you can see that the 2Q we, and minus 2q we cancel out 4p and 2p is 6p then the q's we cancel out r and 2r is 3r 7 plus 8 is 15 so i have 6p plus 3r is equal to 15 and again if you're observant 3 can go in all the entities such that if i divide all 2 by 3 i will have 2p plus r is equal to 5 i cannot call this equation 5 now Looking at equations 4 and 5, I have P plus R is equal to 2, 2P plus R is equal to 5. I can also eliminate R if I subtract these equations one from another. So I'm going to say equation 5 minus equation 4. Okay, if I say equation 5 minus equation 4, that will give me, yeah, 2P. Maybe I should just write all that, all that out out 2p plus r minus in equation 4 p plus r that's the left hand side is equal to 5 minus 2 and that is the right hand side so going ahead to solve this we mean that um, 2p minus p then r minus r the r will cancel out we have p will now be equal to 3 so now i've gotten my p to be 3 
I can take any of the equation as is appropriate to me, either from 4 or 5, and use p is equal to 3 in that. So if I'm to say, using p is equal to 3 in equation 4, I'm going to have, instead of p now, I have 3 plus r is equal to 2, so that r will be 2 minus 3, when 3 moves to the right hand side, and that will be minus 1. Now, I have the value of p is 3, r is minus 1. I can use in any of the original three equations that I'm starting from initially. So, using equation 1, where we have p plus q plus r is equal to 0. If I'm to use p is 3 and r is minus 1, so I'm going to say 3 plus q, now minus 1 is equal to 0, such that... Um, 3 minus 1 is 2, then 2 plus q is 0, and when 2 moves to the right hand side, q will be minus 2. So, with this, I've also been able to get what I was able to obtain with the calculator initially that p is 3, okay, q is minus 2, and r is minus 1. And that is how we solve for simultaneous equation in three variables corresponding to what my calculator gave me initially also. So that question is done and dusted now. And we can now move ahead to say we want to find the factors of the function of x. Now, but now originally, we are given that the function of x is equal to um, p x raised to power 2 plus q x plus r. But from our um, solution so far, we've been able to find the value of p, q, and r. And if you are to put that into the equation, we know that our p is 3, then q was gotten to be um, minus 2, and r was gotten to be minus 1. So if we put that into the equation for the function of x, function of x will now be equal to 3x square minus, okay, plus minus 2x plus minus 1. That's substituting for each value of p, q, and r. So the function of x is 3x raised to the power 2 minus 2x minus 1. And now we are asked that we are to find the factors of this function of x. So now what we need to do to factorize this is looking at this, we are saying that let's try and factorize, but we have some products and we have a sum that we need to take long sense of. The product in this case will be the coefficient of x and the last term. So we have minus 3 x square and the sum is going to give us the second entity which is minus 2x so what two um, factors can we multiply to get minus 3x square and when we sum them it will give us minus 2x and and that that that, that factors if you consider minus 3x and x minus 3x multiplied by x will be minus 3x square okay minus 3x plus x is minus 2x so the second entity in our quadratic equation we are going to use not minus 2x now. We say it is now minus 3x plus x because those are the factors that are suitable for us. So from here, we can now say that in the first two times, we want to factor out 3 already and x because 3x is common to both. So we can say it's 3x into x minus 1 and then already x minus 1 is remaining in the last two times. So that means 1 is just multiplying them. So, this will now give us 3x plus 1 into x minus 1. We are asked to find the factors, not the solution to the quadratic equation. So, our factors have been gotten to be 3x plus 1 and x and x minus 1. And that is the solution to our problem. Yes. In this question, we are to express the function f of x into partial fractions. And that f of x it was given as 2x raised to the power 2 minus x plus 3 divided by x plus 1 into bracket and x raised to the power 2 plus 2 into bracket. Now, how do we express in partial fractions? We express in partial fractions by reverse engineering our, general, our original function and separating it into its constituent um, fractions so in this case we have um something divided by x plus one over something divided by x raised to the power two plus two now because in the first denominator we're only having x 
the numerator will be a but in the second denominator we're having x raised to the power two so that something is going to be bx plus c so this is the tax before us and we are to find the value of a b and c if we can find that then we'll be able to that means we have been able to express this function into partial fractions so um, we can go ahead to say we want to find the LCM of this function, the one to the right hand side. And to do that, all we need to do is to multiply the two denominators, x plus 1 into bracket, x raised to the power 2 plus 2. Now, we find the LCM, x plus 1 will go into each other, so that in the first case we have a into bracket, x raised to the power 2 plus 2, then plus, now, x raised to the power 2 plus 2 will go in each other so that we have bx plus c multiplied by x plus 1. Now, looking at the left hand side and the right hand side, we will notice that the denominator is the same. We, are going, we can leave out the denominator and just take the numerator in both cases, equate them to one another. We will open the bracket and try to find um, what we are going to get as a means of solving for a, b, and c. So if we take the numerator, 2x raised to the power 2 minus x plus 3 will be equal to a multiplied by x raised to the power 2 plus 2a plus, now if you want to open this other bracket, we first take bx and x, so that will be x in two places, we have bx raised to the power 2, okay? Then bx and 1, that will be plus bx, because any number multiplied by 1 is that number, okay? Plus C multiplied by X will be CX. Then plus C multiplied by 1 now. So plus C, because C times 1 is 1. Now we can go ahead to say we want to rearrange such that we are going to find both on the left and the right hand side similar case scenarios in which we have coefficient of x raised to the power 2, coefficient of x, and the constant. So now that will give us the coefficient of x raised to the power 2 are just a and b, and it is additive. So we have a plus b all into bracket of x raised to the power 2, okay? Then the terms for x, we have b and c, bx plus cx. So we have b plus c into x, okay? Then the constants, the ones who are not carrying x at all, we have 2a and c. So we have plus 2a plus c. Now, looking at the left-hand side and the right-hand side, we can see that for both cases, we have coefficient of x raised to the power 2, we have coefficient of x, and we have the constant. So if you are to compare this, we can equate the coefficient of the term plus the one to the left-hand side and the one to the right-hand side, like for x raised to the power 2, we have 2 and a plus b, meaning that a plus b is 2. Then for the one for x, we have minus 1 and b plus c, meaning that b plus c is minus 1. Then the constant 2a plus c is going to give us 3. So this is what we are going to do. And once we get that, we can now say we want to go ahead to solve for all these unknowns, a, b, and c. So if we take all this, we have a plus b is equal to 2. Those are the coefficient of x raised to the power 2. Then we have b plus c is equal to minus 1. That will form equation 2, which is the coefficient of x on both left and right hand side. Then the constant 2a plus c is equal to 3. So we have a simultaneous equation in three variables that we can go ahead to solve. This will be quite easy for us because at least in each of the um, equation, we are seeing that we are only having two, two terms. So we can easily look at how to just oppose, do we want to substitute, do we want to eliminate, and once that is done, our work will be solved easily. So we have our three equations. The first one, a plus b is equal to two. The second one, b plus c is equal to minus one. And the third one, two a plus c is equal to three. So these are, um, three equations, they form simultaneous equation in, yeah, we are having three variables, so we are going to see how we are going to solve them. From equation one, we can make A the subject of the formula, and A will be two minus B. This formula for A, we can say we can use it in 
equation 3. Let's use a is equal to 2 minus b in equation 3. So instead of 2a, we are now going to have 2 into bracket 2 minus b, all right? Then plus c is equal to 3. We can open up this whole bracket to see 2 times 2 is 4 minus b times 2 is minus to minus b plus c is equal to 3 such that minus 2b plus c is equal to 3 minus 4 when 4 moves to the right hand side and we have minus 2b plus c is equal to minus 1 and um, to make it easier we can just multiply all through by minus 1 so we have 2b minus c is equal to 1 we can call this equation 4 now looking at equation 4 and equation 2 we can say we can add the two why am i doing that because i have plus c in equation 2 minus c in equation 4 if i add that together the c's will cancel out so i will be left with an equation with only b as an unknown which i can solve for so if i'm to add that now the c's will cancel out b plus 2b is 3b minus 1 plus 1 is 0 so the value of b from that is 0 so b Zero. then I can take either of equations I, okay let me, let me just say since b is 0 I can use this in equation 4 to get the value of c alright so in equation 4 instead of 2b I will have 0 minus c is equal to 1 so that c is now minus 1 okay so now I have b to be 0 and c to be minus 1 all that is left for me is to just get the value of a and I can use what I got initially as a is equal to 2 minus b. Now b is 0. That means a will just be 2 minus 0. So if I'm to say I'm using b equal to 0 in... Okay, let me even say from equation 1 then a will just be a plus 0 is equal to 2 since b is 0. And that means that my a b is 2. So now we have found our partial fractions and we are saying that um, to express the function that we are giving originally in partial fraction, we said that that function f of x that we are giving originally in the question is equal to a over x plus 1 plus bx plus c all divided by x raised to the power 2 plus 2. Now, if we are to slot in the values of a, b, and c, a was gotten to be 2, b was gotten to be 0, c was gotten to be um, minus 1. So, if we use these values for a, b, and c in the expression for the partial fraction, that means our function of s expressed in partial fraction will be 2 divided by x plus 1. You can say plus um, b is 0, all right? So, that that is knocking itself out then c is minus one plus minus one but instead of saying plus minus one we can just say it is minus one over s raised to the power two plus two and that is the expression in partial fractions as requested you are welcome to div Tutor academy and today we are going to be getting the derivative of a function by using the first Principles. Now, the function that we are given was 5x minus 6 divided by x raised to the power 2. And for us to use the first principles to get the derivative, we need to define another function f of x plus h, where h is just a very small addition to x. So, from our original function, any place where we see x, we now input x plus h. So, we now have our new function to be f of x plus h to be 5 into bracket x plus h minus 6 divided by x plus h over 2. Wherever we just have x, we are now putting x plus h. So, these are the two equations that we are going to use to get our derivative from the first principles. And there is a general formula that is employed to find the derivative from the first principles. And is given that the derivative of the function of x is the limit as h tends to 0 of the function of x plus h minus the function of x all divided by 
h and you know from our initial equation we have the function of x defined already we also have the function of s plus h defined already we just need to plug this into the formula for the derivative from first principle so our derivative the derivative of the function of x will be limit as h tends to zero of now we have function of x plus h okay so the whole of our function of x plus h was gotten to be 5 into bracket x plus h minus 6 divided by x plus h raised to power 2 okay that's the whole of the function of x plus h then minus the function of x now i'm going to put the function of s in brackets to have minus 5x minus 6 over x raised to power 2 all divided by h okay so now we can try and open this a little to say this will give us limit as h tends to zero of if i'm opening the bracket of 5 into bracket x plus h i will have 5x plus 5h now minus 6 divided by x plus h raised to power 2 okay minus 5x when this minus and this minus interact, they will multiply to be positive. So minus 6 over h raised to the power 2, all divided by h. The task before us now is to simplify this. Already we are seeing that 5x and minus 5x will cancel out. So once we are getting all the remaining entities, our aim is that as much as possible, we want to eliminate h from the denominator. Why are we doing that? Because Originally, we take a value of h, turn it towards 0. In the extreme case in which h is equal to 0, we'll see that the denominator will be 0. And in that case, we'll be dividing a number, whatever the denominator is, by h, which is 0. And that will be infinity. So we don't want to use that. We just want to eliminate the h, such that whatever values we have remaining, that will take the of our derivative. So we'll go ahead to do that. And have our equation as limit as h tends to 0 of, now we have 5h, all right, minus 6 divided by x plus h raised to power 2, okay, plus 6 over x raised to power 2, all divided by h. So, now, I can actually bring out my h, which is the denominator, to say we have limit as h tends to 0 of 1 over h okay into brackets now 5h i'm leaving 5h because already um the 1 over h can easily cut 5h and i will know that that will remain 5 but these other two entities let's say i'm finding the lcm i have x squared multiplied by s plus h raised to power 2 so if i'm taking 6 x plus h raised to power 2 will cut out so i have minus 6 x raised to power 2 plus 6 into bracket x plus h raised to power 2 all right so with this i can further um, open up my bracket to see how to also eliminate h from the denominator so i want to open up this x plus h raised to power 2 to see what i'm going to get so if i'm to actually write out my equation again having in mind that i want to open the bracket of x plus h raised to power 2 I'll find the derivative of x to be limit as h tends to 0 of 1 over h multiplied by, now I have 5h already, all right, 5h plus, I found the denominator to be, okay, I'll come back to that. Now this is minus 6 into bracket, minus 6 s square, okay, plus, 6 into bracket x plus h raised to power 2 is what we have initially and that will be s plus h multiplied by x plus h all divided by x square multiplied by s plus h all square now if i'm to open up the bracket of s plus h multiplied by s plus h okay we know okay we have 6 as the multiplying factor so x multiplied by x is x square s multiplied by h in two places will be 2sh then plus h multiplied by h is h raised to power 2 so 
if I'm to put that into my equation now, I have this as the limit as h tends to 0 of 1 over h multiplied by 5h, okay, plus minus 6s square plus 6s square in opening that bracket. Then 6 multiplied by 2sh will be 12sh. And 6 multiplied by h square is 6h square. All divided by s square into bracket s plus h square. Now, minus 6s and 6s square will cut each other out. All right? So, I will have my new expression to be limit as h tends to 0 of 1 over h multiplied by 5h plus now i'm only having 12 sh and 6 h square 6 h is common to both so i can write out in this case you can see 6 h is a common factor to both so i can just say i want to write out my plus 6 h so in the first entity i will have two x remaining and the second one i will have h remaining divided by x raised to power 2 multiplied by x plus h raised to power 2. Now we can see that we are having h common in the two entities now. We have 5h and 6h. So if I'm to factor out that particular h, noting that I have 1 over h initially, and remembering that our aim is to eliminate h from the denominator as much as possible. So I can have this as limit as h tends to 0 of 1 over h into brackets h okay so the remaining will be 5 plus 6 into bracket 2x plus h divided by s raised to power 2 multiplied by x plus h raised to power 2 so with this i can see that h standing alone at the denominator can easily cancel out so that my new expression now i can have to be limit as h tends to 0 of 5 plus 6 into bracket 2x plus h divided by um, x raised to power 2. But now, the expression of finding for x plus h raised to power 2, if you remember, we have gotten initially as written in red with the 6 multiplying it. So if you want to just open that up, we'll see this is limit as h tends to 0 of 5 plus, the numerator is still the same, 6 into bracket 2x plus h, all divided by s raised to power 2. So now I can write this as the value that I got initially for x plus h raised to power 2, okay? So that will be x raised to power 2 plus 2xh, plus h raised to power 2. So, if I'm to now express that, I will have limit as h tends to 0 of 5 plus 6 into bracket 2x plus h divided by, now if I'm multiplying x raised to power 2 into each of the entities in the quadratic function, I have x raised to power 4 plus 2x raised to power 3h okay plus s raised to power 2 h raised to power 2 so now i can now use the extreme value of h tending to zero and um, just to say h is equal to zero as an extreme case now we'll see that all the multiples of h they will cancel out so wherever we have h and the number that is multiplying that we know that that will be like multiplied by zero so all those will cancel out and that will leave us with our solution to be the derivative is 5 plus 12 divided by x raised to power 3. And that is the derivative from first principles. Now we are to find the integral of x multiplied by the square root of 1 minus x dx. And the best way for us to solve this is to use integration by substitution. Because we want to actually find this straight away, we are going to see that it's going to be quite difficult. But if we introduce another um, element, and we can say let u be 1 minus x. So we are going to rewrite our equation as a function of u, not as a function of x now. 
So from u is equal to 1 minus x, du dx will be minus 1 because the integral of minus x is minus 1. Alright? And if we are to cross multiply, we see that du is minus dx. And consequently, if we also reverse that, dx will be minus du. So from u is equal to 1 minus x, we can make x the subject of the formula. When x moves to the left hand side and u moves to the right hand side, we will have x is equal to 1 minus u. So from our original given question, instead of writing the integral of x multiplied by the square root of 1 minus x dx, let's substitute for all the values of x, 1 minus x, and ds. So now x will be 1 minus u, right? Then 1 minus x, we notice that that is u. So we have root u because square root of 1 minus x, so we have square root of u. Now instead of writing dx, you can see that dx is now minus du. dx is now minus du. And this is what we can now go ahead to try and solve. Because we've substituted for the value of x, 1 minus x, and dx. So we can try and solve this because this is quite simpler for us. We can easily open up the brackets, bring in the law of indices, differentiate, and our answers will come out for us. So this will give us integral of 1 minus u multiplied by u raised to power 1 over 2 because square root of u is u raised to power 1 over 2. Then multiply by minus du. All right? So if you bring the negative forward, that will be minus u raised to power 1 over 2 multiplied by 1 minus u du. So if you want to just solve this, we can see that this is quite better than what we have initially. And we can go ahead to try and solve that. Um, if we are to open the bracket, we know that minus u raised to power 1 over 2 times 1 is minus u raised to power 1 over 2. Minus u raised to power 1 over 2 times minus u, the negative signs will multiply each other out to be plus. Then half we add to 1. So we have u raised to power 3 over 2 and we're integrating with respect to u. So we have du. Alright? So now, generally, if you want to bring the formula for integration, now we just need to add 1 to the power and divide by the new power. So the negative sign is still retaining its position. We have u raised to power half plus 1 divided by the new the new, um, the new power, which is half plus one. The same thing applied to u raised to power three over two. We had one and divide by the new power, which is three over two plus one. And solving this, we have u raised to power minus three over two divided by three over two because half plus one is three over two. All right, then three over two plus one that will be five over two. Okay, and then the new power will also be expressed as the denominator three over two over 2. Then we have the constant of integration plus mean introduced. Now these two we normally come up for us to have minus 2 over 3 multiplied by u raised to power 3 over 2. Okay. Plus now 3 plus 2 divided by 2 is 5 over 2. And the same in the same way 2 will come up. So we have 2 divided by 5 u raised to power 5 over 2 plus c. But nobody gave us u originally in the question. So we can recall that our u is actually 1 minus x. So we can bring in 1 minus x back so that our equation will now be the integral of x multiplied by the square root of 1 minus x ds is, we just write this equation to say 2 over 5. Now instead of writing u, u is 1 minus x raised to the power 5 over 2, okay? minus 2 over 3, 1 minus x raised to the power 3 over 2 plus the constant of equation C. And that is our solution. This to so here in this question, we are giving the ranks of 10 candidates in two tests and we are to calculate the Spearman's rank correlation coefficient. Now, um, what do we use the Spearman's rank correlation coefficient for? Is this to test for the strength or the weaknesses in the relationship between two sets of data. And in this particular case, it will be a means of testing for 
how strong or how weak the candidate perform in the two tests that are being considered in this particular case. So there is a general formula that is used to obtain the Spearman's rank correlation coefficient. But for us to use that formula, we are going to generate a table of values. And from that table of values, we will look at the marks in each of the tests. We will find the difference in the marks and then we will find the square of the difference. As a rule of thumb, for us to know that we are on track, the difference is straight sum up to be zero. After we have gotten the difference of all the tests, the difference should sum up to zero. But then we are still going to find the square of the difference. So if you are to populate our table here, for test one, we also input the values as given in the table. And then the same thing we also do for the test two. Okay. Now, once this is done, we can now say we want to find the difference. The difference will be the difference between the test one and test two. Like in the first case, we have 10 and 10. So we can say 10 minus 10. And that will be 0. So 6 minus 9 minus 3. 4 minus 3 is 1. 5 minus 4, 1. 3 minus 2, 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. Okay. 8 minus 5 is 3. 9 minus 6 is 3. 7 minus 8 is minus 1. And 2 minus 7 is minus 5. For us to know that we track, we are not missing our question. We need to check. Let's check for the sum of these differences. And if we bring in our calculator and input all the values, 0 minus 3 plus 1 in 3 places, plus 0 plus 3 in 2 places, then minus 1 and minus 5. Okay, that is 0. That means that we didn't make any mistake from our calculation so far. Then we can now go ahead to say we want to um, evaluate the square of the difference. So, for each entry, we can get the square. Square of 0 is 0. Square of minus 3 is 9. Square of 1 is always 1. Square of 0 is 0. Square of 3, as we got before, is also 9. Square of minus 1 is 1. Square of minus 5 is 25. Okay? So, now, what is the formula for the Spearman's rank correlation coefficient? We are going to be making use of um, the sum of the square of the difference. So, if we input all those, 0 plus 9 plus 1 in 3 places, plus 0 plus 9 in 2 places, plus 1 plus 25, that's 56. So, sigma d raised to the power 2 is 56. Then we are going to try and evaluate our Spearman's rank correlation coefficient from this. And generally, the Spearman's rank correlation coefficient R is given as 1 minus 6 multiplied by sigma d square over n into n square minus 1. Now, n is the number of entry, and d raised to the power 2 is the square of the difference, and we have summed that already. So if you need to consider that n is the number of, in this particular case, number of samples we are giving, which corresponds to the number of candidates, which is 10, such that our R is equal to 1 minus 6 times 56 over 10 into bracket, 10 raised to the power 2 minus 1, okay? So then we want to evaluate that. That will be 1 minus, let's bring in our calculator. So 56 times 5 times 6, I mean. So that's 336 divided by 10 into 10 raised to the power 2 is 100. 100 minus 1 is 99. Okay? So if we want to use our calculator to solve for that, 336 divided by 10 times 99, the calculator will just divide also. So we add that to be 56 over 165. So we have 1 minus. 56 over 165. Okay, and as we find the LCM as 165, we are going to have 165 minus 56. So, what's 165 minus 56? Okay, we can even just say 1 minus answer. So, that's 109 over 165. So, we have this to be 109 minus, then 109 divided by 165. And 
if you want to get that in decimal places, that's 0 0.660. So this is 0 0.66. The fact that the rank elevation is positive means that the two tests are a good juxtaposition of one another. They have a strong relationship. In this question, we are told that a committee of three men and two women is to be formed from four men and six women. So let's note that we are given that is a committee of three men and two women out of four men and six women. So we are to find the number of committees that can be formed if there are no restrictions, then the number of committees that can be formed if a particular man and a particular woman cannot serve together on the same committee. Um, without any restrictions, okay, that's the condition that we are given. We are to get three out of four men, okay, and two out of six women. This is a simple question on combination, okay. So three out of four men will be four combination three, okay. Then we have multiplied by two out of six women will be six combination two. So it's as simple as just getting this value and multiplying them together. So what we can do, four combination three will be four factorial, and four factorial is four multiplied by three factorial because I know the three factorial will cut out, then divided by the same three factorial multiplied by four minus three factorial, and six combination two will be six times five times four factorial, then six minus two, 6 minus 2 factorial multiplied by 2 factorial as the base. So if I were to open up the, those brackets and simplify this, in the first case, the 3 factorials will cut out, then 4 minus 3 is actually 1, so I will have 4 over 1 here. Then multiply by the second case, we can have 6 times 5 times 4 factorial over 2 factorial is 2 times 1, all right? Then multiply by 6 minus 2 is 4 factorial. The 4 factorials will also cancel out. Then 2 can cut 6. And this will be 4 times 3 times 5. That's 12 times 5, which is 60 ways. So we have 60 ways to pick this particular question if there are no restrictions. Okay, good. Now in the second case, we are told that a particular man and a particular woman cannot serve together on the same committee. As an advocacy for working smartly, let's consider a case in which first they can serve together. We are told that they cannot serve, okay? But let's consider a case that they can serve together. Then we know that the number of ways will be, now, the total fixed number of ways minus a case in which they cannot serve together. So if you have to assume that they must serve together, that means that we are fixing their position. We are restricting their more. We cannot actually take them out. So that we mean that we don't we have taken out one man then we have taken out one woman also so we'll now be left with um two men to be taken out of three men and one woman to be taken out of five men so if they must serve together that means their position are fixed and then we can find the remaining options of which we can actually just substitute um this answer here from 60 committees that we got initially. So, if you are to evaluate this particular case in which they must serve together, you can say it's 3 combination 2 multiplied by 5 combination 1, okay? Because one of the men is fixed already and one of the women is fixed already also. So, we can just evaluate this to be this multiplied by 5 multiplied by 4 factorial over 1 factorial into 5 minus 1 factorial, okay? So if you want to evaluate that, that will just be 3 multiplied by 2 factorial over 2 factorial, 3 minus 2 is 1. Those two factorials will cut out, then 5 times 4 factorial divided by 1 times 4 factorial. The other four factorials will also cut out. So that this will just be 3 times 5, and that is 15 committees. Now, this is the case in which they must serve together. And already, you know, we are only talking about the same three men out of four and two women out of six. So the case in which they cannot serve together will be 60, which is the total when we don't have any restriction, minus this particular case in which they must serve together. So we can just express that out that if they cannot serve together, 
then we have 60 minus 15. So it's just 60 minus 15, and that is 45 committees. 45 committees is what we can get if they cannot serve together on the same committee. So here yeah, we have this lovely question that I love so much. We are told that one out of every three boats produced by a machine is effective. If four of the boats produced by the machines are selected at random, we have to find the probability that exactly two are defective, at least one is effective, or at most two are defective. This is a classical example of what is called the binomial probability. And the formula that is used to express this is n combination r multiplied by the pro probability of success raised to power r, then multiplied by the probability of failure, which now be 1 minus p. If p is success, then 1 minus p is failure, raised to power n minus r. Now, I'm going to interpret this. So, this is the probability of getting r successes on n repeated trials in an exercise that has two possible outcomes. And this formula is actually fitting our question perfectly because we have our two possible outcomes to be that is either the boat is defective or the boat is not defective. So we are looking for R successes out of N repeated trials. So now that, that will fit exactly into our question, but we need to note, okay, what is the case of um, a success and what is the case of a failure? For this particular question, we are being told that um, we have um, some boats that are produced, some may be defective, some will be non-defective. So we can take the defective as failure, the non-defective as success, or we can even reverse it as I'm going to do here. So I'm going to say that the probability of selecting a defective boat, that's um, the P, probability of D, probability of selecting a defective boat, is going to be, we are told that one out of every three boats is defective, so that would be one over three. Then the probability of selecting a non-defective boat will now be 1 minus the probability of selecting a defective boat because of the rule of probability. The sum we add up to 1. So that will now be 1 minus 1 over 3, which is 2 over 3. So if you want to use the binomial probability in this particular case, like the first question is quite um, straightforward. We are told that we have to find the probability that exactly two boats that are picked out of four are defective. That means we are going to be having two boats that were picked to be defective, two to be non-defective. And already we know that the total possible outcomes is four because we are selecting two out of four. So that will give us like four combination, two probability of having defective raised to power two, then probability of having non-defective raised to power four minus two. And that is what we are going to do exactly. So, the probability that exactly two of the four boats are defective will now give us now we have two out of four, alright? So, that will be four combination two because our N, the total number of outcomes is four. We want to pick two cases out of it. So, we have four combination two multiply the probability of defective raised to power 2, then probability of non-defective raised to power 4 minus 2. And we are to just evaluate that. 4 combination 2 is 4 factorial divided by 4 minus 2 factorial multiplied by 2 factorial. Then multiply by the, what's the probability for the defective? That's 1 over 3 raised to power 2. Multiply the probability for the non-defective. That's 2 over 3 also raised to power 2. So if we are to Express this out, I can just say this is 4 times 3 times 2 factorial over 4 minus 2 is 2, so we have 2 factorial, then 2 factorial is 2 times 1. The 2 factorials will cancel out, then this I can multiply with 1 over 3 raised to power 2 is 1 over 9. 2 over 3 raised to power 2 will be 4 over 9, okay? So if I'm to multiply all that out and cut as appropriate, as you can see, that will give me 8 over 27. That is the probability of selecting exactly two boats that are defective. Again, okay, question number B, we have to find the probability that at least one of the four boats selected is defective. Now, let's interpret this question. That means that we're having four boats, okay, but at least 
one of them is defective. I've always been telling us I'm an advocacy for working smart. We don't want to be trying to evaluate situations in which uh, one is defective, two are defective, three are defective, four are defective. No, we don't need that. So if you are to pictorially depict this, let's say in this first case, we don't have any that is defective being represented by the red ink. Then in the second case, we have one that is defective being represented by blue. In the second case, we have two that are defective being represented by blue, then two non-defective being represented by red, and on and on like that. Now, we can see each of these scenarios, all right? But the case in which we are going to have at least one of the boats to be defective are the second to the last scenarios that are being shown in um, the box. They are being boxed together. These are the cases in which at least one of the boats is defective, all right? I use blue to represent the defective boats here. So this implies that the probability that we need to get is 1 minus the case in which none of the boats is defective. The standalone case, the one to the left, is the case in which none of the boats that is selected is defective. So instead of just taking the probability for each of the four cases, you can just say it is 1 minus probability that none is defective. So if you want to bring in our formula, so we have none is defective out of 4, that is 0 is defective out of 4. That will give us 4 combinations, 0 multiplied by the probability of defective, which is 0, okay, raised to power 0, then multiply by the probability of the non-defective time to, in this case, which is now 4. I hope, we, I, I'm trusting that we just get this because it's quite easy if we take our time to understand it. So if you bring in our formula, um, expressing 4 combinations, 0, as 4 factorial over 4 minus 0 factorial 0 factorial then probability of the defective is 1 over 3 raised to the power 0 then non-defective 2 over 3 raised to the power 4 so now if you want to just write this out this will be 1 minus 4 factorial over 4 factorial 0 factorial is 1 so we don't need that 1 over 3 raised to the power 0 is also 1 then multiply by 2 raised to the power 4 is 16 3 raised to the power 4 is 81 so that will give us 1 minus 16 over 81. And we are to express that, that will be 1 minus 16 over 81. And that will give us 65 over 81. Just noting that we can use 1 minus probability that none is defective out of 4 will help us to solve this. Instead of taking each cases in which at least 1, at least 2. No, we don't need to follow that track. So in this C scenario, we are told that at most 2 boats that are picked are defective. Again, let's just find this as a very good means that we can use to interpret it. We are told that, of course, there are four boats, but we are having, we are asked to have the probability that at most two of those boats that are picked are defective. Okay? Now, just like we are doing in the other case, I will also draw out all those case scenarios in which at most two of the boats are going to be defective. So, we are going to have that stretched out now. So we are told at most, okay? So let's draw those case scenarios in which you can have at most two out of the four are defective. So I have, in this case, all, all blue. I'm using blue to represent those that are not defective. They are okay. So blue is okay in this case, okay? So for this first case, we are saying that all, are, all, all of them are good. All of them are not defective, okay? So, in the second case scenario, let's have a case in which um, one of them will be defective. So, we have three blues and one red, okay? So, yeah, we have that one out of four, okay? Just only one out of four is defective. And then, in the third scenario, let's have that just two, in this case now, we are going to have two out of the four boats to be defective. So the two in red are defective. The two in blue, they are quite good. They are non-defective. So here we have, this is the case in which we have at most two are defective. All right. So the probability that we are being asked to find will be the consideration of these three scenarios because initially none is defective. In the middle case, one is defective. In the last case, that is the maximum. That is the point at which we have the maximum defective to be two. So we are going to have 
to get the probability of at most two are defective, we'll have probability of none is defective, okay, plus the probability of one is defective and three are not defective, okay, plus the probability that two are defective and two are non defective. So we just need to plug in our combination formula for the binomial probability here. None is effective will be four combinations zero into probability of defective raised to power zero. We will now multiply by the probability of non defective raised to power four. So once we have that plus the probability for one is effective will be four combination one now because we are having one to be defective. Multiply by the probability of the defective. Defective will now be one. Multiply by the probability of non defective now to be three. You can you can notice this is just like the binomial expansion. In the third case, we have probability of two are defective, four combination two. Multiply by the probability of defective raised to power two, okay? Multiply by the probability of non-defective raised to power two also. So, this is what we just need to um, open up. Four combination zero is just one, just like we found in the previous question. Then one, multiply by one over three raised to power zero, multiply by two over three raised to power four, okay? plus for combination one well, we can just we can also work that out i did that is four so you can see if you want to show the working for combination one is or four times three factorial divided by four minus one is three factorial and then we can see that that will give us four then for combination two is four times three times two factorial over four minus two is two factorial then multiply by two factorial the two factorials we cut out and this will give us 6. So we can just plug in those values into the equation straight. Okay. So we can add plus. This is 4. 4 multiplied by probability of defective 1 over 3 raised to power 1 times probability of non defective 2 over 3 raised to power 3 plus. Now 4 combination 2 is 6. Multiply by probability of defective 1 over 3 raised to power 2 times probability of non-defective 2 over 3 raised to power 2. So, I'll just simplify this. 1 times 1 over 3 raised to power 0 is 1. Then 2 over 3 raised to power 4 is 16 over 81. 2 raised to power 4 and 3 raised to power 4. Then in the second case, we have 4 multiplied by 1 over 3. Then 2 over 3 raised to power 3, that will be 8 over 3 times 3 times 3. That's 27, all right? Okay, and the last case in which we have 6 multiplied by 1 over 3 raised to the power 2 will be 1 over 9. 2 over 3 raised to the power 2 will be 4 over 9. Now, I don't want to cut out because the same base will apply to all the 3. Now, we have 8 times 4, 32 over 81. Okay, and the third is 6 times 1 times 4, 24 over 9 times 9 is 81. So, if you are to add... 16 and 32 and 24, 16 plus 32 plus 24, that will be 72. So we have 72 over 81. I think 9 can go in, in both numerator and denominator. So if I divide by 9, this will be 8 and this will be 9. So the probability of getting at most two of the both to be defective will be 8 over 9. What an interesting question. We are given three forces acting on a body of mass 1.2 kg and we are to find the resultant force and the acceleration of the body. Now, to get the resultant force, that will mean that the concentration of all three forces and finding a force that can represent all of them that is acting on the body. And to do this, the best approach is to divide this into the components of the resultant force. We are going to have an horizontal component and we are going to have a vertical component. So, if we denote that with X and Y, we can see that the 6 Newton force is only lying on the Y axis, whereas the 8 Newton force is inclined at an angle to both the X and the Y axis. So, we are going to find the resolution to both the vertical and the horizontal axis and we can use that to get the vertical and horizontal component of the 8 Newton force and the same thing we do to the 4.5 Newton force. So, taking the 8 Newton force, we have um, an, a vertical component and an horizontal component. So, how do we go about this? Now, at 
the point of its angle, we will see that this will be angle 30 degrees such so that 30 and 150 will add up to 180, which is the angle of a straight line. So here we are going to have the resolution on the vertical axis will be 8 cos 30. And not to be confused, you can work out how we got that. This is forming a triangle in which you can take 8 as the hypotenuse. This is angle 30. Then we have here as the opposite of angle 30 and this as the adjacent. So 8 is the hypotenuse. And then by the principle of Sokatua, we can consider sine theta, cos theta, and tan theta. But if we want to find the um, vertical component, which is the adjacent, we can say that that will correspond to cos 30 is equal to, cos 30 is adjacent over hypotenuse. So here we have the adjacent divided by 8 which is the hypotenuse, so that the adjacent, which is the vertical component here, will now be 8 cos 30. That is how we arrive at this. And the same principle applies to the other side. So the horizontal component is 8 sin 30. So in the same way, we can look at the 4.5 Newton force and also resolve it into its vertical and horizontal components. Here, the angle will now be 60 because 60 plus 120 is 180, which is angle on a straight line. So we have the horizontal component to give us 4.5 sine 60, and then the vertical component coming down will give us 4.5, see, 4.5 cos 60 degrees. So we have gotten the resolution of each of these forces to the horizontal and vertical axis. Now the horizontal force will be the sum of all these forces considering the horizontal and the vertical axis. So if you call this R1, this R2, and this R3, we can find R total, which you are using to denote the resultant force as um, divided into the horizontal and the vertical component, and then that will be the sum of each of the forces with respect to their component, both horizontal-wise and vertical-wise. So we have R1x and R1y plus R2x, where x is the horizontal component and y is the vertical component, plus R3x, R3y. So our task is just to plug in our values into all the handles so that we are going to have our resultant force to be... Now let's take... R1x, we can see that R1 does not have any horizontal component, so that would be zero. And then it has a vertical component which is directly on the y axis, that would be six newton, and it is positive because it is on the positive y axis, so we have six. Now, for the second force, the eight newton force, we can see that on the horizontal axis, eight sine 30 is on the negative side of the axis. So we are going to put that as negative, and 8 cos 30 is also on the net negative side. So we are going to have the component of the second force to be minus 8 sin 30, and the vertical component is going to be minus 8 cos 30. It's because of the notation that I'm using here. So some other people would have said that they want to draw 8 cos 150, 8 sine 150, but breaking down into in, breaking breaking it down into its component like this, I prefer so that I can easily just plug in my value. So for the 4.5 newton, the horizontal component is positive, so I have 4.5 sine 60, while the vertical component is negative, so I have minus 4.5 cos 60. So the resultant force RT R total is now 0 minus 8 sine 30 plus 4.5 sine 60, adding them component-wise, that's for the horizontal component. Then vertical component, 6 minus 8 cos 30 minus 4.5 cos 60. So if you are to add all this, let me bring in my calculator. So I have minus 8 sine 30 plus 4.5 sine 60, okay, 
that will be minus 0 0.10288568383. I can round that up to all decimal places. So we have minus 0 0.1089. That is for the x component, for the horizontal component. Then for the vertical component, we have 6 minus 8 cos 30 minus 4.5 cos 60. And that will be minus 3.1782. So minus 3.1782. So now these are the vertical and horizontal components for the resultant force. We have the horizontal as x, Rx and the vertical as Ry. But we also find the magnitude of the resultant force. So that magnitude, the magnitude of that resultant force will be the square root of the sum of the squares of the vertical and the horizontal component. So, if you are to evaluate that with a calculator, you are saying we are going to find square root of the Rx raised to power 2 plus Ry raised to power 2. So, you can just say minus 0 0.1089 raised to power 2 plus um, minus 3.1782 raised to power 2. Now, the sum will be 10.0891. So, we have square root of 10.0891. And if you are to evaluate that, that will give us root answer 3.1763. We can just round off to any appropriate decimal places that we like. For me, I will just say that will be 3.176 newtons. That is the resultant, that's the magnitude of the resultant force. Okay, so now we also have to find the acceleration of the body. And from the question, we have been given the mass to be 1.2 kilogram. Then we just need to record that force is mass times acceleration. F is equal to ma. We just got our F and m was given in the question. So F is the resultant force which got to be 3.176 newtons, and the mass M was given in the question to be 1.2 kilograms. So M is 1.2 kg. So meaning that the acceleration is what we are looking for. And from our original equation, acceleration will be force over the mass. That will be 3.176 divided by 1.2, divided by 1.2. So we can also use our calculator to find that our answer divided by 1.2. So we have 2.6469. Okay, so our acceleration is, to round it up, is 2.647 meter per second square. Okay, yeah, we are told that a stone is dropped from the top of a building which is 80 meters high. Then we have to find in meter per second the velocity with which it hits the ground. We have to take acceleration due to gravity as 10 meter per second square. So now if you are drawing our building and we have a stone that is to be dropped from the top of the building, okay? Then we are told that um, this building is 80 meters high. This is 80 meters. That's the height of the building. All right? Okay? Then we have to drop that stone and we have to find the velocity with which it hits the ground. Now, when they say that they are dropping, the initial velocity is zero, okay? Because initially, before they drop it, you'll be holding a stone before you drop it. So, initial velocity u is zero meter per second. We have to find the final velocity v, and we are told that the acceleration due to gravity g is 10 meter per second square. So, from our equations of motion, which equation is actually best fitting our question here, we can see it is um, V square is equal to U square plus 2 AS, in which our hertz now will be 80 meters. V is what we are looking for. We know U to be zero, and acceleration due to gravity, G will be our acceleration in this case, because it's a free fall. So we have our distance to be 80 meters. So we can input all these values into the equation. I can say the V raised to power 2 that we are looking for, V raised to power 2 is equal to 0 plus 
2 multiplied by acceleration due to gravity is 10, okay? Then the distance is 80. So if you are to evaluate that, we have 2 times 10 is 20, 20 times 80 is 1,600. So V will be the square root of 1,600. And that is going to give us 40 meter per second. So that's our answer. In this question, we are given that vector A is 6i minus 5j, vector B is 2i plus 7j, and vector C is 8i plus 2j. And we are to find x and y such that c is equal to xa plus yb. Now, in this particular question, x and y are being given as scalars, and c was given as xa plus yb. All we just need to do is to substitute for c, a, and b. And then we open up our bracket, putting the value of c is equal to 8i plus 2j. That's vector c is equal to x. x is a scalar which is multiplying vector a. So we have x into bracket. a is 6i minus 5j, all right? Plus y is another scalar multiplying vector b. And b is 2i plus 7j. So we have y into bracket 2i plus 7j. Now, having this, we can go ahead and open up our bracket. So, we are going to open up that bracket. And after opening up the bracket, we can now collect the like terms. But first, let's open up the bracket. So, we are going to have 8i plus 2j is equal to 6xi minus 5xj plus 2yi plus 7yj. And now, if you rearrange, you can say this is 2i, 8i plus 2j is equal to, looking at the i component, we have 6x and 2y. So we have into bracket 6x plus 2y, all multiplied by i, okay? Then looking at the j component, we have minus 5x and 7y. So we can also group those together. We have minus 5x plus 7y on the right j. And now we have um, two sides of the equation. We have the left-hand side, we have the right-hand side. And since they are equal, component-wise, the component of i on the left-hand side will be equal to the component of i on the right-hand side. So we have 6x plus 2y is equal to 8. And now we can divide all through by 2 to get 3x plus y is equal to 4. And we can call that equation 1. Then looking at the other component, the j component, we can see that we have minus 5x plus 7y is equal to the j component on the left hand side is 2. So we have minus 5x plus 7y is equal to 2 as our equation 2. So this is now a simultaneous equation in two variables that we can solve with whatever method is suitable for. I'm going to be using the substitution method so now from equation one, if I am to make y the subject of the formula, I can move 3x to the right hand side so that I have y is equal to 4 minus 3x and I can call this equation 3. Now I can use equation 3 in equation 2 so that anywhere I see y, instead of writing y, I will now put in 4 minus 3x. So equation 2 will now give me um, minus 5x plus 7 Instead of y, I will now put all the values of y of equation 3, which is 4 minus 3x, and then that is equal to 2. Now, I can open up that bracket. Okay, so, open up the bracket to now give me minus 5x. 7 multiplied by 4 is 28. 7 multiplied by minus 3x is minus 21x is equal to 2. Okay. So, now, minus 5x minus 21x will be minus 26x. I will move 28 to the right hand side, so I have 2 minus 28, such that minus 26x is equal to minus 26. And dividing both sides by minus 26, note minus 26, x will now be equal to 1. So now that's the value of x, and I can substitute x is equal to 1 in any of the three equations that I have. Um, now from equation 3, you know that y is equal to 4 minus 3x. But instead of saying x now, we can just substitute 1 for x. So that is 4 minus 3 times 1, and that is equal to 1. So 
um, the scalars x and y that we're asked to find is that x is equal to 1 and y is also equal to 1. That's the solution to our question. So here in our question, we are giving vectors a and b such that the magnitude of a is 3 cm, the magnitude of b is 10 cm, and the magnitude of vectors a plus b is root 139. We have to find the angle between a and b and the dot product of a and b. And first, before we just go ahead to um, try and evaluate this, I would like to draw a representation of vectors a and b so that we have a plus b. Now, the first thing that should come to mind is the parallelogram law of vector. Since we are having vector a and vector b and vectors and vector a plus b. So, if you are to note our Cartesian coordinate and let's say this is our a and we also have our b like this inclined at an angle to each other, the vector a plus b we can denote as the resultant of the two vectors. Okay, so if we draw a parallel to vector B and another parallel to vector A, the vector A plus B, which is the resultant vector, is going to be looking like the diagonal here. So this is vector A plus B. And then we're asked to find the angle between vectors a and b that's been shown in green that is the angle between vectors a and b all right so let's call that alpha but now looking at this diagram we can note another angle here so this angle we will call it theta now by the cosine rule which is the resolution of the parallelogram law of vectors normally we can express a, b, and a plus b um, in a relationship with one another. And that is given that the magnitude of a plus b raised to power 2 is equal to the magnitude of a raised to power 2 plus the magnitude of b raised to power 2 minus 2 multiplied by magnitude of a multiplied by magnitude of b multiplied by the cosine of angle theta. And we are noting our angle theta already is not the angle between the vectors a and b it's just as noted in the diagram so if you are to substitute um, with respect to all these values we are going to have um, root 139 raised to power 2 is equal to 3 raised to power 2 plus 10 raised to power 2 minus 2 times 3 times 10 cos theta now we don't know theta and we know the other values so we can say we want to evaluate that the square root and the square will knock themselves out so that we have 139. 3 raised to the power 2 is 9. 10 raised to the power 2 is 100. 2 times 3 times 10 is 60. So we have this. And if we move 60 cos theta to the left hand side, that will give us one, 9 plus 100 is 109. Then 139, 139 moves to the right hand side, that will be minus 139. So we have 60 cos theta is equal to minus 30. And if we divide both sides by 60, okay, so we have cos theta is equal to minus, that's 1 over 2, that's minus 0 0.5. So theta will be arc cos 0 minus 0 0.5. Now, we don't want to make that mistake. We don't want to leave out the neg negative sign. So we have arc cos minus 0 0.5 so if we take out our calculator and we try to evaluate that that will be 120 degrees so angle theta is 120 degrees now but looking at the diagram that we noted the other time we are asked to find angle half and not angle theta but because um, this vector a is also parallel to this notation line that we indicated before. This is also angle alpha. And alpha and theta, actually, they are supplementary. They add up to 180. So we can say that theta and alpha, they are supplementary. 
So since they are supplementary like that, that means that they add up to 180 degrees. So we can say that um, theta plus alpha is equal to 180 degrees. And that means that alpha is equal to 180 minus theta. Now we have gotten theta to be 120 degrees. So our alpha will be 180 minus 120 and that will be equal to 60 degrees. So the angle between vectors A and B is 60 degrees. So now we're asked to find the dot product of vectors A and B. Now the scalar or dot product is defined as a product of the equilateral magnitudes and the cosine of the angle between the two vectors. And here we are talking about vectors A and B. So A dot B is equal to magnitude of A multiplied by magnitude of B cos the angle between the two. We have gotten that angle to be 60. So we know the magnitude of A and B. Inputting that, we are going to have 30 cos 60. And cos 60 is 0 0.5. So that will be 30 multiplied by 0 0.5. And that is 15. All right, that is all for our video today. It has been quite a long journey, but hopefully you have gained one or two things. You have been able to actually prepare for your exam. Now you have the confidence to go ahead and get distinction in that examination. Now it's Dave Tooth Academy where we are devoted to building academic excellence in students. And if you are here to subscribe, please kindly go ahead, click on the subscription icon, click on the notification icon so that you can have access to all of our videos as we upload them. And if you can check we have a lot of playlists that are going to help you develop academic excellence in your subject. Until next time, God bless you and we wish you all the very best.